In this video, we'll be repairing and restoring the Sega Pico. I bought this a few months ago on eBay, with the item's description saying it had a broken ink. However, when the item arrived, it was not well packaged, with no protection causing major damage on the other side of the ink. Because of this damage, the Pico can no longer stay closed, with the bottom slab now falling out with little movement. So, we will have to fix this, clean the Pico as it's quite grubby and dirty, and also discuss the hardware that the Sega Pico is powered by. The Sega Pico uses the same power and composite video cables used on the Sega Mega Drive 2. To test if the device works, we're going to use the Storyware cartridge. So let's insert the cartridge and plug both cables in and power on the device. So as you can see, nothing displays on the screen, so it's either the cartridge or the cartridge slot, which is having an issue. But we will not notice until we actually do the teardown. So without further ado, Let's begin the repair and restoration. So, let's begin. First we need to turn the Pico over to its back. Where we can see 8 exposed screws around the body that need to be removed. One by one we remove each screw. We then pop off the plastic cover, which inside shows an additional screw and also allows us to free the pen wire from the shell. We can then lift the Pico up and then slowly place the front shell down on the table. We need to be careful as there are six ribbon cables connected at the bottom and a ground cable screwed in. We remove these one by one. With that done, we can now pull away both halves and place the motherboard half of the shell to one side while we focus on the front side. We then turn over the shell to remove the first broken hinge. We then carefully remove the ribbon and wired cables, which will allow us to remove the touchpad board and then finally the last remaining hinge. Now with everything disassembled, we can now focus our attention on the broken hinge. Now the hinges are completely broken, from the screw posts to the lips around the hinge. I first start by trying to repair them using super glue. However, while it looked like it was successful, the process, the next day proved to be the complete opposite. So I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. Honestly, um, I'm particularly happy that these posts here have taken well they have and this part here has gone really well. Um, I'm not particularly very happy uh, with these cracks. They aren't very good, I don't. Um, but it's the best I can do, honestly. And then I picked up this piece this morning and the whole middle was shattered. And I can show you, it's gone right through the other side. It gets completely shattered and there you go. Because honestly, I'm not particularly very happy. I don't really want to put that piece back into the system knowing that this is this whole piece is not very sturdy and it's got to basically hold the um the top uh, the top part of the pico so yeah um just thinking about what to do honestly um but i'm not happy with that i mean uh, and i could understand for these things that are that hold um they are gonna like plastic is gonna become brittle 
uh, the plastic has become very weak and any kind of um, slight movement it might just cause it's breaking a break uh, break because the cracks could be inside the plastic itself but yeah um yeah i'm not too sure i'm just gonna think about what to do now so i began to do some research and came across a very interesting video which discussed in a video about using your smartphone to 3D scan objects and import them into a program called Mesh Room. So I tried it, I took around about 150 images from all sides of each of the hinges and imported them into Mesh Room. Unfortunately, the program did not detect the hinges, which ruled out using this method. I also looked online for 3D printers, but nothing in my price range was able to print large objects like this. So the search continued. I next decided to create a post on several UK 3D printing Facebook groups to look for some advice or if anyone provides 3D printing services to produce these parts. A 3D printing company called Be Captivated Milling and 3D Printing Services got in contact with me in regards to the free parts and showed me their own work that they have done. I was extremely impressed with their work, especially the shells for the retro consoles, for example the Dreamcast. So we came to an agreement and I sent the parts off to them. We'll check back on these parts and the progress in part 2. We now focus our attention on the main boards. There are two boards which are attached to the shell, the motherboard and the IAC P-sensor board, which are screwed down. Two screws need to be removed from the IAC P-sensor board, and then we need to remove the 10 screws located around the main Pico board. However, first we need to remove the pen, which is connected to the main board. With that done, we can now remove all the screws. With all the screws now removed, we can now remove the two boards away from the shell. And put the shell to one side as we'll be cleaning it later in the episode. So with all the main screws now removed, we have two additional screws left to remove, which is holding down the metal shield. With all the screws now removed, we get our first look of the main board, which powers the Sega Pico. Let's now talk about what powers this system. The Sega Pico has relatively the same hardware as its 16-bit video game counterpart, the Sega Mega Drive. While there are similarities to the Mega Drive, the Pico does not contain two chips from the Mega Drive. The Zilog Z80 and the Yamaha YM2612 chip for driving FM sound. We'll discuss this in a moment how the Pico is able to achieve its own sound. The Pico uses the Motorola 68000 CPU. It's a SIS microprocessor clocked at 7.67 MHz. The Motorola 68000 contains a 32-bit instruction set which can run at high speeds. However, it can only execute 32-bit instruction by performing two 16-bit operations internally. It also has a 24-bit address bus and a 16-bit external data bus. Variations of the 68000 CPU were used in a wide range of computers such as the Apple Lisa, the Atari ST and the Amiga line of computers. Sega will continue to use the 68000 CPU in its 32-bit console, the Sega Saturn. But instead of CPU, it would be used as the sound processor for the system instead. Next to the CPU is the Pico 64KB of main RAM. The VDP, short for Video Display Processor, is essentially the heart of the Sega Pico. 
It supports multiple resolution modes depending on the region and is able to display two graphics planes which can be moved independently. A window subplane with tile graphics that does not scroll with the rest of the plane. And finally, the sprite plane. The VDP can display up to 80 sprites on screen. However, it is limited to up to 20 sprites on the same scan line before it results in sprite overload issues. The sound on the Pico is done by the PSG chip inside the Pico's VDP, which is the Texas Instruments SN76489. Optionally, developers can use the PMC chip, which was also used on the Sega System 16, and can be used for drums and samples. The VDP also uses the VRAM on the Pico, which is 64 kilobytes and holds the tiles. Like the custom chip of the VDP, the Sega Pico also has its own custom dedicated chip too, with the printed name Sega 315-5640, and acts as a touchpad controller for the system. The Pico uses touchpad technology in the form of electromagnetism, to send signals, and the Pico does not need to be physically touched in order to operate. So now we're going to clean all the ports, the switch, the connectors and the cartridge connector to remove all the old grime built up from over the years of use. With the cartridge connector I use a cotton bud and IPA to remove all the dirt and grime and then use contact cleaner after. I keep it certain and injecting the StoryWare cartridge to unclog any remaining dirt that's built up inside the cartridge port. We're now going to remove and reapply a new thermal paste to the 7805 regulator. So with all the ports now clean, let's put the shield back on and screw it down. I also give the StoryWare cartridge a clean too, using contact cleaner and some isopropyl alcohol with a cotton bud. Next we are going to test to see if everything works, if the system powers on and if the cartridge detects. So let's power on the unit and wait and yes we have the Pico boot screen, which shortly should be followed by the actual main story. And it does, which is great news. So now that we know that the Pico is now turning on and recognizes cartridges, we can now focus our attention on the rest of the restoration. So now we're going to start the cleaning process, starting with the pen. The cable itself is dirty and it has a lot of grime over it. So we get a kitchen towel, apply IPA and start the cleaning. As you can see it is very dirty so we need to continue cleaning it until all the dirt is gone. And after several minutes we now have a much cleaner pen. So next, we focus our attention on the shell. It's got marks and is also very dirty. But before we clean it, we need to repair the cartridge door flap that doesn't seem to retract when you eject a cartridge. So let's now turn our attention over to the shell and focus our attention on this area. We need to remove the spring which is holding down the cartridge flap case. Once removed, we can carefully remove it away from the main shell, which will allow us to now focus our attention on just the cartridge flaps. And examining the springs, we can see that one of the springs is absolutely fine, while the other is slightly bent. So we'll need to fix this. To remove the flap we need to slightly bend it which will release it from its hinges. 
With that, we can now see the issue of the spring. To fix it, we need to remove the bent part and then use pliers to basically form a new straight part, which will form the opening and closing mechanism for the cartridge flap. And after that, we can now reinstall it back and test it with a StoryWare cartridge to see if it works. And success, it works. With that done, we can now move on to the next part of the restoration. The next thing we're going to do is clean up the shell. As you can see, there's a lot of dirt and grime and also marks around the shell that have just built up over the years, which we will remove using IPA. Normally I would tear down the whole thing and then wash it, but unfortunately because of these posts, which are holding down the touchpad, it is impossible to remove it without damaging the actual unit. So let's begin the cleaning process with some IPA and scrubbing it away with a kitchen towel. And that is a lot of dirt. So, with the shell now fully clean, let's now move our attention over to the next shell. And as you can see, it's the same case with it being very dirty. But also, the purple plastic has this color. This is very similar to light plastic, which turns yellow over time. So we might have to look at doing a retro bright, but for now, let's give the shell a clean. And while not perfect, the shell is much cleaner than it was before. We will definitely need to look at the RetroBride option, but for now, let's conclude the episode. So, we've done a lot in this episode. We've disassembled, cleaned, and discussed the hardware of the Sega Pico. But we still have a lot more work to do. However, we're going to leave that until part two. Until then, thank you so much for watching and bye for now.